Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time I think and we feel to start making sense to ask uh, questions why are we making theater but also how are we producing it and for whom and uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community. So I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Hillary Miller. Um, welcome to Then Now, considering 1970s New York City and performance today. Uh, we're very excited to be here um, at the Prelude Festival uh, 2021 um, for this panel discussion. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I just wanted to um, very quickly uh, give a little bit of a background of the genesis of um, this panel and why we're here today, why we thought that this would be um, an exciting addition to the lineup of Prelude events. Um, when the uh, when the pause uh, occurred, when the lockdown occurred in March of 2020, I had actually been teaching a um, a New York City in 1970s uh, class, theater class, New York City in 1970s um, at the Graduate Center, actually where I'm uh, live recording live from now, and um, it was a really uncanny experience to have the um, uh, to have COVID um, begin at a moment when I was uh, studying and investigating closely uh, theater during the 1970s with a group of students, um, because it was pretty quickly that I saw a lot of the similar language and a lot of the rhetoric uh, that was occurring um, in articles about what was happening in the city um, very quickly started to sound like what we had been reading. So there were questions about um, whether uh, the wealthy fleeing New York would irreparably damage the arts. There were questions about um, uh, whether neighborhoods needed to just be completely rethought as things shifted. Um, there were questions about whether tourist activity um, would irreparably damage the progress of the arts and the creativity of the artists living here. There were questions about whether um, artists could remain here. So a lot of the questions that were very quickly bubbling to the surface, at least within the arts performance community, um, started to sound familiar. And that was also on the very, very um, essential level of can artists survive? Can they have what they need not only to make work, but also to live? So um, as all of this was occurring, I was also um, seeing more and more a kind of hearkening back to the 1970s as a potential moment of inspiration also. Um, and it was, I think it, it was actually Jerry Seinfeld's um, article in the New York Times that he wrote. He wrote an opinion piece arguing, um, it was called, So You Think New York is Dead. And the very first paragraph of the article um, essentially retold the story of him moving to the city in 1976 when it was an incredibly difficult, flawed place, but he argued there was nowhere he would rather be. So it, it, in that sense, the city was positioned as kind of inspiration for, we, we had a moment that we could look back to for the recovery. So as I was kind of taking in all of these different notes and ideas um, 
for why and in different ways people were essentially returning to this decade um, when thinking and worrying and um, problem solving around the city and New York and its arts, um, Frank and I uh, were discussing, Frank Hedger and I were discussing this question of, um, is there a way to create a historical perspective on a prelude panel that would allow us to um, draw some insights to contemporary performance today. So the idea that we can do that today and kind of take a step back and say, we're just gonna look at this um, discrete period of time and look at what was happening in the city, what changed in the city, and um, hopefully see what can really profitably be culled from the research that we've been doing, um, whether it be as cautionary tales or as, um, a sense of legacy or just inspiration, new perspectives. So for that reason, um, I'm very excited to have our panelists here uh, today um, and very excited to uh, learn from them and from their work on, uh, on the decade. So um, we have with us today, um, panelist uh, Julia Folks uh, is going to be speaking first um, and then um, Karen Jaime will be speaking after. Um, and so and if, if anyone has um, tuned in also expecting to hear Ryan Don and unfortunately, he could not um, be with us today. So uh, we are going to proceed uh, with these two panelists and I'm very excited to hear their work. So I'll first um, have the opportunity to introduce uh, Julia Folks is on the faculty of the New School and is the author of A Place for Us, West Side Story and New York. Uh, that's from 2016. To the City, Urban Photographs of the New Deal from 2011, and Modern Bodies, Dance and American Modernism from Martha Graham to Alvin Ailey from 2002, and most recently, Realizing the New School, Lessons from the Past, 2020, um, and that is with Mark Larimore. She curated the exhibition Voice of My City, Jerome Robbins and New York from 2018 to 2019, which hopefully you didn't miss, um, and appeared in Netta Yurashaw uh, apologies for pronunciation, para modernities as a writer speaker on Bob Fosse. Um, Julia is a 2021-22 fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and is at work on a book about the rise of New York as, as a capital of culture in the 20th century. And we are so excited, um, Julia, to have you with us today. Thank you. Did you want to introduce Karen or I'm going to go? Oh, I apologize. Yes, I was going to, I, I will introduce Karen um, at, the, uh, at the onset of her presentation. Great. So um, I'm delighted to be here with you and thank um, the Siegel Center and Hillary for the invitation to speak. Um, so I was hoping to draw up some slides so that you have something to look at. Lovely. Um, there we go, I think. Can everybody see? Um, so I, uh, from this prompt, which is, I think, such a great one um, to be thinking about um, the 1970s in the context of today, I really appreciated the way that Hillary spoke about the kinds of things that are echoing from that moment. And I think she's quite right. And I look forward to sort of deeper conversation. Um, I'm in the midst of writing a history of New York City's cultural affairs, um, cultural activities since the 1940s. And the 1970s really do stand out. Um, the fiscal crisis is the one that seems to have impacted the arts even more than many other crises during the last 75 years. Uh, World War II, McCarthyism, the war in Vietnam, even the terrorist attack on 9-11. Um, while the nation and the city may be part of national tragedies such as the war in Vietnam, it's when the city becomes a less desirable place to live that we reach a crisis, it seems to me. That the arts are a lens by which we gauge this livability I think is just one indication of how tied they have become to the city itself. It's easy to spout numbers in support of this, but I'll mention only one. Um, by 1960, two thirds of the nation's artists lived in New York City. While artists have dispersed to more places since then, uh, New York City is still the home to the widest variety of the arts in which people work. Many New Yorkers are artists, even more New Yorkers participate in the arts, whether as a viewer, a dabbler, or a professional. The arts are a part of our everyday life in the city. Um, I credit this 
partly to the initiation and consolidation of the first municipal cultural policy in the country in New York. Mayor Robert Ragner ran his reelection campaign in 1960 with a promise to support the cultural activities of the diverse array of peoples who lived here. I believe this was a reaction to the enormous undertaking of the development of the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, which had just broken ground in 1959, the largest performing arts complex in the country in the midst of the largest urban renewal project in the country. Lincoln Center swallowed up a huge amount of resources, including federal, state, and local monies, in addition to foundation, individual, and corporate support. A white travertine marble mausoleum, many thought, to the traditional elite performing arts of Europe, opera, symphony, ballet, and theater. Mayor Wagner could not ignore the inherent imbalance in such giving to the arts in this city of immigrants from around the world and migrants from Puerto Rico and the American South in particular. So acting on his campaign promise, he established an Office of Cultural Affairs in 1962 that is very much still with us. The office really struggled to deliver on Wagner's promise, though. With an unsalaried executive at the top, it was largely devoted to ceremonial affairs and to supporting the powerful people who barked the loudest, mainly those at Lincoln Center and Joseph Papp. Um, the next mayor, John Lindsay, had more success in broadening what was possible. While public monies overwhelmingly supported large conventional cultural institutions, which long had separate lines in the city's budget, cultural affairs um, got a bit of discretionary spending starting in the late 60s and expanding significantly in the 1970s. And they turned it over primarily to organizations and initiatives that moved the arts into parks, onto streets, and beyond Manhattan. This is the legacy that I want to consider in relation to our current moment, moving the arts outdoors. Small amounts of funding had real impact. Um, the new Harlem Cultural Council created a jazz mobile led by the pianist Billy Taylor and a dance mobile led by the choreographer Elio Pomari. They were so successful that a year later, the council planned it to add an opera mobile, a drama mobile, a science mobile, and a puppet mobile. None of those came into existence, um, an indication of the ongoing fight for any kind of funds. But both Jazzmobile and Dancemobile continued and, and still in revised form to this day. The idea of taking the arts to parks and streets was not new necessarily. Street theater had been around at least since the 1950s and Papp had instituted the idea with Shakespeare in the Park by the late 50s. What was new was sanctioning the idea with city funds and initiative. Arts offered outdoors spread in the 1970s, affirming the idea and remaking, enacting the idea that the arts were everywhere. Um, I have a, a slide missing, so I'll go on. Let me just see if I put it in the wrong place. Nope, it's not coming up. Okay, um, so one of the best examples of this is a picture that I don't have, but it's a festooned festival truck that the Cultural Affairs Department made. The department outfitted a truck with decorations, art supplies, platforms, refreshments, a sound system, and then traveled to six neighborhoods um, in one summer, for instance, from the Lower East Side to Crown Heights in Brooklyn and Spanish Harlem. A splashy brochure promoting the venture claimed that these festivals interrupted the ordinary workaday patterns of life and inspired people to respond freely and with imagination to their surroundings, it claimed. An artist was employed to help the process, uh, work with the community for a few weeks before the truck uh, came. And th those artists would break down the limits of habit, they said, and stimulate participation with a free spirit. Even the white behemoth soon followed suit. Lincoln Center began sponsoring arts in its outdoors in the plaza. First in 1971, a street theater festival, and by 1974, the beginning of the ongoing out of doors festival. Artists be too began conceiving their work outdoors as well. Uh, the example I like to bring up is the one of Twyla Tharp, who conceived of dances in parks, museums, gymnasiums, as well as conventional proscenium stages for the first 10 years of her career from the mid 60s to the mid 70s. A day long performance series of performances on May 28, 1971 
began with a more formal dance in Fort Tyron Park at 5 a.m. in the morning with three dancers, including uh, Tharp. And then the trio traveled to Battery Park for a noontime performance of drills accompanied by 14 student dancers to a high school marching band from Brooklyn. And then the day ended at City Hall when the three danced to sitar players conjuring up the grandeur of performances in Indian palaces in our own municipal palace. So, you know, one of the questions then sort of is what did moving creative expression to the outdoors really mean? Um, so there's some argument for that, that observers became participants in a different way. As the brochure for the festival truck put it, they offer the energy of their attention. They provide the human envelope, the setting for celebration. The idea of who were involved in the arts encompassed not only those who were deliberately viewing the performance, I would argue, but also passers-by, the only slightly interested, the older woman looking out the window on the street, expanding the idea of who might the arts be for, but also who might they be operating with or participating with. Government officials and others touted that this participation activated democracy and even more expanded it to a wider group of people. But there's no clear way to prove that. Cultural policy existed on the hope that all different kinds of participation with the arts expanded thought, expression, and creativity. If people could imagine worlds, they could be more active in the world immediately around them. There were more cynical intentions as well. Upheavals in the city were occurring with rapid intensity in response to the dramatic um, different kinds of events that were occurring in the nation at large and in the city itself. Government officials saw the arts and parks and arts in the parks as a way to diffuse conflict conflict and, and de-escalate um, conflict. The, the arts were viewed as a kind of release valve capable of lowering the building pressure in the fight for belonging and thriving in the city. But as urban scholar Mariana Mogilevich argues, putting the arts into public spaces does not necessarily mean that they are democratic or even public, um, taking into account the myriad definition of those words. Often the arts are even just ignored outside or easily dismissed. Um, so one of the questions is, is the, is the relation to, to democracy that choice, that choice of ignoring what's right in front of you. But a more prosaic vision of the democratization of the arts in this period is the general support of public funds, even very small, really. The specific effort to use those funds more evenly across the city in geographic terms, even though still the bulk remained in Manhattan. And then the recognition of artistic works of various ethnic groups, limited as all that was. What I think is more sure is that arts and artists in more locations and in key sites, such as Central Park or in City Hall, reinforce the role of the arts in our daily and symbolic experiences of living in the city. The arts become both fixed and happenstance, poured in concrete in the halls and theaters and sculpture around us and effervescent and random through encounters in festivals, on streets and activities in the park. So today, the connection I see is, um, you know, what's often touted about New York City's cultural policy of the 1970s is the rise of the argument for arts and culture in economic terms. And that certainly is something that we've lived with since the 1970s and very much, um, you know, with a, a nod to Martin Siegel, um, the, the benefactor of the Siegel Theater, because he really uh, articulated and argued for and convinced policymakers of this idea that arts and culture are a, a dominant industry in New York City and that um, we shoot ourselves in the foot, according to him, uh, if, if we're not in fact investing um, the very small amounts and expanding the investment that we have in the arts because they return, as he said, four to one. You know, you put one dollar in, you get four back from the kind of economic boost that comes from the arts. But I'd like to point to this other legacy, I think, of the 1970s, as much as that may still be with us as well, the idea of culture paying. Um, I think that the arts of every day are when this really begins um, to be instantiated in many ways in, in, our, in our cultural life in New York City. And that's another longstanding legacy, focusing 
I think, attention not on visitors and tourists as sort of the economic argument often uh, relies upon, but on city residents. Um, and this very much, of course, also draws tourists to New York City. Uh, Martin Siegel liked to say that people don't come to New York City to ski or to scuba dive. They come to walk. They come to witness the theater of the streets as much as that inside on the stages. Um, so in early 2020, this was my street. This was musicians, you know, living on the block, put up an impromptu concert right across from where I lived. Um, and they did it for the people on the block. And then now they play regularly on the weekends on open street around the corner from me. So when the pandemic shut down theaters and indoor spaces, the streets opened up for our need and desire for creativity and expression. So for one, I think the continuation of um, open streets is a, a good thing and, a, and an attention to residents um, in a way that I think is important to think through um, the impact of the arts today, not just as to who might come to the theaters from elsewhere, but actually who lives here and participates and wants this, it's choosing to live here be, very much because of the theater of the streets. Thanks. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, there's so much there and I'm excited to discuss it more after we hear from our um, next presenter panelist, um, who I'm excited to introduce, um, Karen Jaime, uh, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Performing and Media Arts and Latino Latina Studies at Cornell University. An accomplished spoken, spoken word performance artist, Karen served as the host curator for the Friday Night Poetry Slam at the world-renowned New York Poets Cafe from 2003 to 2005. And in her book, The Queer New York Racialized Sexualities and Aesthetics in Loisida, coming out 2021, uh, maybe it's already out or coming out. Yes, it is. Okay, already out, congratulations. This can double as a, as a book celebration. Um, uh, she argues in it for a re-examination of the cafe as a historically queer space. Uh, Karen's poetry is included in The Best of Panic and Vivo from the East Village, Flicker and Spark, a queer anthology of spoken word and poetry, in a special issue of Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural lesbian literary and arts journal, Out Latina Lesbians, and in the anthology Latinas, Struggles and Protest in 21st Century USA. And I'm excited to introduce Karen Jaime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me get on to, are we able to see the PowerPoint? Yes? I won't know. I guess someone will tell me if, yeah, oh, perfect. Okay, good afternoon. I wanted to just start off and thank um, Frank, the Siegel Center, Hillary, Tanvi and Jackie for all of their help with this and for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to join you here today in order to discuss the legacy of the New York Poets Cafe, both as a performance space and as the site for the emergence of what I termed the New York aesthetic. For those unfamiliar with the cafe, it was founded in 1973 during the heyday of New York's Puerto Rican community's nationalist liberation movements. The name of the cafe specifically includes the term New York initially a pejorative term that was directed at co-founders Miguel Algarín and Miguel Piñero, following a reading in Puerto Rico where due to their usage of English rather than Spanish in their writing, they were deemed less authentically Puerto Rican. So here we see the original spelling, um, the negative epithet which was New York Rican and New York Rican, their appropriation of it. Um, Algarín and Piñero reappropriate the term New York Rican, spell it phonetically, and claim it as a form of empowerment, ultimately including it in the name of their poetry cafe located in Loisaida. I use the term Loisaida deliberately rather than um, referring to it as the Lower East Side or Alphabet City or the East Village because Loisaida is an ethnic enclave within the boundaries of the Lower East Side, primarily inhabited by New Yorkans and other immigrant communities prior to gentrification circa late 1980s. Through Algarín's and Piñero's reclamation and their inclusion of it in the cafe's name, New Yorican with an uppercase N comes to signify an ethnic, political, and cultural identity 
signifying Puerto Rican community, culture, and struggle in New York City in the 1970s. Um, in my book, which just came out in June, The Queer New Rican Racialized Sexualities and Aesthetics in Loisaida, I trace the continuing impact of the cafe on New York City performance, that which begins in the 1970s, by focusing on the connection between queerness and the performances happening in the cafe since its founding. In turn, I argue that the cafe's history is queer, not just in terms of sexualities, but also in terms of how performance practices develop there that challenge notions of low versus high art, rejected constructions of what constituted quote unquote proper writing, challenged the politics of authenticity as they pertain to ethnic identity, and in turn devised artworks challenging racism, colonialism, and poverty. Moreover, I examine how the performances occurring inside the New Yorican were informed and affected by the socio-political and economic changes occurring outside of it. So if we look at this image, this is an um, early image of the New Yorican around the 1980s, um, followed by this image, and this is the New Yorican Poets Cafe that I first walked into in the late 1990s. And then we have the final image, which is of the current New Yorican, um, although that might change a bit since the cafe, we could talk about this later, since the cafe has received a grant to develop unused areas of the space. Um, it's significant to mention It's significant to mention that the changes occurring outside of the cafe due to a renewed economic investment in the neighborhood, alongside the popularity of poetry slam as a performance genre, um, lead to a change in the people both attending and performing in the space, resulting in the space, or in the cafe rather, no longer operating as a primarily local space. So, Sorry about that. For, you, for those of you that aren't familiar, Poetry Slam is a three round poetry competition consisting of five poets. The poets are judged by five sets of randomly selected groups of judges on a scale of one to 10, including decimal points. One's the lowest score, 10 is the highest. Sorry, everyone. I think we're having some technical difficulties. We will look into this and um, I'm resume. Am I back? I think I'm back. You are. OK. Um, how far back should I go? Uh, just, the, uh, just starting the Poetry Slam slide is perfect. OK. So quick recap, and this reminds me of my days hosting the Poetry Slam at the New Yorican. For those not familiar with the Poetry Slam, it's a three round poetry competition. It consists of five poets. The poets themselves are judged by five sets of randomly selected groups of judges on a scale of one to 10, including decimal points. One's the lowest score possible, 10 is the highest. Highest and the lowest scores are dropped, and so the highest possible score you can receive is a 30. This is important when we think about performance, um, specifically because oftentimes the performances are devised to try to get the highest score possible. So it's less about content and more about form. Um, and so the, there's this increasing popularity at the New Yorican, which informs the type of performances happening inside of the cafe. Um, also, more people are attending performances at the cafe um, because of the popularity of Poetry Slam. So the cafe no longer operates as a primarily local community space. This move away from the local also impacts the term New Yorican, how it was used, and more importantly, who it referred to. So while New Yorican is an ethnic marker initially used to refer to people born and or raised in New York City of Puerto Rican descent, it started being used to refer to poets and performers affiliated with the cafe. New Yorican became both ethnic marker and arguably a brand, which for me has always been problematic. I think in part because of my relationship with the cafe, 
um, I began performing there shortly after graduating college in the late 1990s and eventually served as the host. And I have had a personal, I developed a personal connection, not just with the space, but with the New Yorican community, although I'm not ethnically New Yorican. And so in turn, I always questioned whether there was a way to recognize contemporary poets and performers who align themselves with the original mission and politics of the cafe. What about them, right? Who weren't necessarily Puerto Rican. Moreover, what about queerness and how did it impact the type of work produced? Um, as an answer to these questions, I proposed the development in the 1990s of a lowercase New Yorican aesthetic um, that queers fix definitions of New Yorican identity by recognizing and including queer poets and performers of color whose writing and performance build upon the politics inherent in the cafe's founding, extending them within Loisaida's changing demographics. The New Yorican aesthetic operates as a queer artistic practice that facilitates my tracing of the cafe's queer history, a queer history that is intertwined with the spatial politics that helped engender racialized sexualities that play out in poetry, hip hop theater, drag, camp theatrics, and audiovisual cultural productions. So as such, in my book, I document the interventions made by queer and trans artists of color at the cafe, beginning with the writing, performance, and sexuality of cafe co-founder. And here I am actually going to switch out of my iPads so that So can everybody hear me? Got it. Um, so I start off looking at the um, the work of uh, co-founder Miguel Vinero. Downtown, uptown, midtown, cross town. His body was found all over town, seeking echo, seeking echo. Found in the potter's fields of an old D, found in the barries with the DDT. His legs were left in Vietnam. His arms were found in Sing Sing. His scalp is on Nixon's belt. His blood paints the streets of the ghetto. His eyes are still looking for Jesus to come down on some cloud and make everything all right when Jesus died in Attica. Um, followed by looking at the work of. Um... <laughs> further away. Reggie Kabiko. The government asks me to check one if I want money. I say, how could you ask me to be one race? I stand proudly before you, a fierce Filipino who knows how to belt hard gospel songs played to African drums at a Catholic mass and loving the music to suffering beats and lashes from men's eyes in the capital streets. Uh, an event that used to occur in the New York, at the New York Poets Cafe from 1998 to um, 2008 entitled The Glam Slam, which was a combination of a poetry slam competition and a Harlem drag ball. So in this clip, we'll definitely see a, uh, someone who continues to be a part of sort of downtown New York City performance, um, downtown New York City performance community and culture. So this is- lovely. Okay, next I wanna to introduce to you our five celebrity judges who will be handing out the trophies tonight. And first up, we have gossip columnist Diva. She is a legend and her name is Michael Musto. Michael Musto. Michael, 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 Time is sliding down your spine, yeah, you know what's on my mind. Crystal and time travel, unravel me like two strings. This much elementary, one verse from school to me, make two of me, teaching me the history of this insane. Tell me, warm each other out like 30 secrets hidden. 
Um, so I highlight queerness in the space and as part of the cafe's history, because in making visible queer sexuality, sexual identities, and performative strategies as present, if occluded at the cafe since its inception, I show that the changing demogra demography and culture of Boisaida from a predominantly immigrant, racial, minoritarian, working class space to a, to a more gentrified white middle class neighborhood also led to the queering of the term Neorican, with the shift in the populace of Loisaida represented in the aesthetic practices that then emerged at the cafe. Yet the aesthetic used by these poets no longer functions as culturally specific. It now refers to a diasporic performance modality with the cafe as its physical home space or symbolic site of origin. This then becomes the enduring legacy of the New Eurekan Poets Cafe, specifically how its history as a performance space that is historically grounded continues to inform contemporary performance practices. Um, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. So I think that there are a lot of different directions um, we can go in. I will throw out uh, one thing that is bubbling to the surface for me and where we can just grab hold of it or move on to something else. Um, one thing, you know, um, Karen, you brought up the local, um, which was, I know, threaded through Julia's discussion as well. Um, and it's something that I would love to be able to um, hear you both talk a little bit more about this relationship between uh, local neighborhoods and their institutions. And if we're able to also think a little bit about the work that's happening also then on the stage. So as an example could be, you know, I was thinking about um, an institution like the Brooklyn Academy of Music BAM during the 1970s and how much it was, at least in, in my understanding, really doing a little bit of everything, trying to expand its mission as um, a kind of stage for the neighborhood, even though it was also at this very same time involved in a lot of initiatives that now, as we look back on it, seems to have been also a driver of gentrification in the area. So it creates a bit of attention for some of these local institutions. And so I wonder if we could look at the New Yorican or Julia, if you have any examples um, of how these institutions at the time um, were both um, embracing their local neighborhood in really specific ways, um, but maybe as you were mentioning, uh, Karen, getting further from its mission of the local neighborhood performance. So I'm I'm interested in just any of these contradictions of the local and the space that might be coming out of the discussion. Yes, yeah, please. Um, I mean, thank you so much. That's a great question. So I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So this is going to be like stream of consciousness thought answer process. In thinking about the New Yorkian, so it starts out local, right, and it closes in '82 because the roof caves in. You know, the building itself was originally a space used by Ellen Stewart of La Mama as a space to, you know, jazz musicians coming in to perform. This is where she put them up. And they were, so, it, and, and there was this plan of turning it into like, a, quote unquote, like Hispanic theater, right? Like she was friends with Algarin, Miguel Algarin. So there's, there's this relationship to that. So it closes in 82, doesn't reopen in 88 until Miguel Pinero's demise. And it's re, uh, the idea for reopening actually comes from Bob Holman, right? Who is the owner and the founder of the Bowery Poetry Club. And he's the person that introduces Poetry Slam to the cafe. And at first the Poetry Slam at the cafe is not necessarily drawing all of these audiences, right? Like when Reggie Cabico first enters the space, he's like, you could see tumbleweed down the street along with the syringes. Like that's, that's what he was walking into. You know, circa 1996, we see this change happen with Saul Williams' um, uh, independent film entitled Slam and this documentary Slam Nation by Paul Devlin, who shines a light on this, this group of poets, not just at the New Yorkian, but the national competition itself. And that group, that team from the New Yorkian included not just Saul Williams, but, um, and he recently just passed away, Craig Mums Grant, um, actor who was part of Labyrinth Theater, who was on the television show Oz, um, 
was on, uh, I can't remember the other show, but so you have this, you know, this, this increased focus on the New Yorican and it's like, oh, this poetry slam thing could actually lead to me having a career doing something else. And as actors, right, specifically, we think of someone like Bosia also. So you see this, this legacy, this, this interest bubbling up. So all of a sudden people from outside of the community are attending. There are other events occurring at the cafe that people from the community continue to attend, but now there's there's different money coming in. There's a different community that's interacting with it. You have the proximity of NYU and NYU students making that a place to go on Friday nights and then buying up of real estate, pushing people out. All of a sudden the cafe becomes this site of sort of, yes, it was this countercultural history, but it's also this cool place that if I go, then I'm 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 part of that. I, I'm enacting or performing this sort of countercultural identity, whether or not I know the history of the space, whether or not I'm invested in those politics. So the space adapts in some ways by continuing to, you know, the near the, the poetry, there are people that do stuff and that perform in the poetry slam that, you know, as I mentioned in the book, are really committed and invested in the history, right? So it's it's balancing that out and balancing how you can continue to have this space as a site for the community to feel a part of. And I mean, you have to make money because the rent has gone up. So there are all of these things. And what does it mean also when we think about legacies, 1970s New York, we think of 1970s performers, how many of them are still alive, right? Like, the, you know, Miguel Algarín as a founder of the New York Poets Cafe just passed last December. So that part of the legacy then is like things, there's, there's, you know, environmental shifts, there's shifts in terms of people, there's shifts in terms of what spaces mean, and whether or not, you know, the evolution includes the surrounding community, but what does it mean when the surrounding community itself changes, right? Like it's a community, so it's out as a local community space, but what happens when the community around it can't afford to live there anymore? I don't know if that answers your question, but that was, okay. I'll just jump in and off that. I think that the New Yorican Cafe is such a good example of the ways in which, and you know, success leads to <laughs> some problems. And you know, but but the, one of the things I think that is that you brought up, Karen, that I think is so important is to understand it as a platform, right? It's a platform. It it, it becomes an institution in and of itself that leads to a kind of global platform, at least a national platform, or at least an entertainment platform. You know, for a lot of people to really. Um, you know, become successful in one way or the other. And, and you know, Hillary bringing up BAM is such an interesting example because it is an, it was an organization, I think maybe it still is, but it, it more clearly was an organization that had one foot that said, we want, they were really worried about getting crowds. They were really worried about people coming, taking the train to Brooklyn in the 1970s. How do we convince people to do that? So they were very much involved in what we now call gentrification efforts. Um, but at the same time, they recognized that that community also deserved to be there um, in the theaters as well. So they were very bifurcated, I think, in, in what they offered. They offered the next wave festival of European avant-garde, weird art, if you will, um, though, to try to lure Manhattanites out to Brooklyn. And then they offered and still do um, the uh, African Dance Festival uh, every May um, that became and still is Dance Africa that is, a, is an enormous, um, directly connected to the community that was there <laughs> more so, the Caribbean and African population that has now moved further out of Brooklyn, but still come back very dedicated to that particular festival. Um, so it's really trying to do a little bit of both, which I think is, 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 is a kind of reckoning in some of the ways that you were talking about, Karen, of, of a kind of, if you have a legacy, how do you stand on it and utilize it? You know, um, because it seems to me that it's a place like the New York Rican Cafe should stand on it, you know, should be um, proclaiming what um, was possible there and is still possible there and, and could be to a much wider audience than the local community. And at the same time, I think it's really important to, to look around you directly and figure out how you connect to the people who live directly. It seems to me that that's one way to think about being a healthy institution in New York City. The change is relentless. Maybe, I mean, we say that, <laughs> a lot of things are stuck perhaps too, um, but I, I think that it's important to recognize that 
institutions need to be relevant to where they are, to where they live, as much as they have to understand how they provide a platform for lots of people to get far beyond that particular neighborhood and that particular place. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, and, and directly related, I think, is this question of institutional sustainability. And, and it feels that, um, you know, from, from my research, one of, this, one of the frustrating things is that often in the, the organizations that struggled the most in the 70s were the smaller ones doing the most vibrant, you know, work directly related to communities. Um, many of those smaller theater organizations then couldn't survive the 70s for all of the pressures that we know. And um, at moments right now, it can feel a little bit uncomfortable. Like, is the same thing happening? You know, we just read about the Lark closing. That was a major playwright development program that closed. And many, we can all name organizations, arts organizations that closed during this 2020, 2021 time period. And I'm, I'm curious sort of thinking about the 70s how we think about institutional sustainability then. And I wonder, Julia, you mentioned budget um, and the sort of very different place that they thought about arts funding at the time um, than we do now today, which is which I think is generally great. Um, but also for the New Yorkian, I mean, the brass tacks of how an organization like that is able to bounce back after, for example, a roof caving in or something. Um, when does that money come like for La Mama? When does it come from the Ford Foundation? And when is it actually the city making the investment and saying, this is absolutely part of the lifeblood of the city? And so I'm just curious to hear if there are um, thoughts circulating about um, any lessons that we can take from, let's say, budgetary changes that might have happened in the 70s, Julia, you know, as you were discussing, uh, more of a, a shift, more maybe geographically, you know, money shouldn't just be in Manhattan. Um, if there's like a specific something that we can hang our hat on when we think about organizations and sustainability, because my, my I'll just say, I asked the question because I have a sort of secret hope that right now we, we are talking so much more about what organizations need to keep their doors open today and because of the moment that we're in. And I don't know if that's gonna lead to real concrete change, but my hope is that it will. So I'm curious if, if you have um, just any thoughts about um, this question of real, like the, the real financial sustainability for organizations, um, how you look back at that and its relationship with the cultural policy that you've been studying and investigating. Well, I, I'm more hopeful too, <laughs> you know, in the sense that, um, you know, the federal government is under this administration is providing more money than we expected a year ago. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, I think that the recognition on the fact of, you know, New York state senators, um, even de Blasio, um, you know, that, that the arts, what, what I, what I see a little bit of a shift is that yes, we're open for business. The, new, the city is trying. Broadway is back, and it's everybody has to come. And you know, it's still got that kind of um, "I love New York" kind of promotional uh, push a little bit. But I would say that it is also it also has artists live here and the city artist core um, that the cultural affairs program I think is a, is a good one. Is this like, this? these are people who live here and they need the money now <laughs> and let them produce something. You know, at, the way that I see it anyway is that it's fairly open. It's fairly, it's not a ton of money. Um, but the other thing, and I know that this comes up in your work too, Hillary, is that the other thing that I like to point out about the 1970s is Manhattan Plaza, which is, subsidized housing for artists, for theater artists in particular, and that opened in the mid 70s, Section 8 housing. Um, if we could just figure out how to house people, the wide variety of people um, that are being priced out just because they don't happen to have a lot of money or they are not in a field that gives them a lot of money in terms of their income, if we could recognize the vitality of the city depends on the variety of people who are able to live here, um, you know, I, I want to believe that we could get somewhere by focusing on housing, literally as housing, and that artists would benefit from that 
um, if and even more particularly, maybe we could figure out how to do another project like Manhattan Plaza, <laughs> um, where we could, you know, we have very few examples and they've been enormously successful, the West Beth and uh, Manhattan Plaza. There are not many others that I can think of. I don't know if I'm missing, but those are sort of the two. And, you know, 1960s, 1970s, not since then. Um, and yet they have been enormously important for a lot of working artists' lives. So I'd love to see that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think. I know I have a couple of friends who are artists who've managed to had to get on a list to get an apartment in the middle. Of like, um, but I think something more sustainable on a larger scale, um, I think, is important. I mean, I like thinking about. So the New Yorker receives a 5.3 million dollar grant from the city in 2013 for repairs and renovations, and you know, really changing the space. But tying that into your point, Julia, that I think that's fantastic in terms of maintaining the space. But what does it mean to maintain a space where the artists aren't the the the, the sort of artists that are part of a legacy of art making? Not you know what not and and I'm drawing here from like Sarah Shulman's gentrification of the mind. One of my but thinking about people that are coming as like trust fund kids, we're like I want to be an artist, but. That that's not that's not the type of work, and that that it's not a knock on them. It's not a personal indictment. It's to say that there needs to be a space in the city for people that don't necessarily have the financial backing, right? Like that that safety that safety security net that I think really made art what it was, and the artistic community gave the artistic community its its not just vibrancy, but you know, the radicalism of it, right, was I'm going to be an artist. I'm not going to have that net. I'm going to take this risk. You know, that's seen in the type of work that's produced, right? It, it's not, I, I don't have this safety net that's going to, if I mess up, it's okay. And I have this inside track to, you know, to moments. No, you you came here and, you know, there was ABC Rio and then all of these different pyramid club that closed. So it's sustaining the, the venues. Yes, that's important. But it's also reconfiguring or the, the city so that artists aren't priced out so that they can use those venues. Because now once the spaces are renovated, who's using them? Right? Who's creating art in them? Does that not also inform the politics of the spaces themselves? So now it's it's a nice shiny New Yorkan for nice shiny New Yorkers that are that just it for me that's that's a problem and that the, it's attention. It's attention. I'm happy with the renovations. Let's get us new ceilings. Let's get us wider doorways. But let's also make it affordable so that artists creating work that are really challenging, you know, boundaries, so that they're able to live here and make the work. Yeah, that's a great example of what I was asking about um, in terms of allocation of funds and, and what we're supporting. Um, and you know, it also reminds me there was a sort of period where um, it felt like every week there was another opinion piece, like about a year ago, about using the WPA arts programs as sort of inspiration for right now, um, which I think is wonderful. Like I find many of those programs very inspiring too. Um, but I, you know, I know a number of people who are looking at the the CETA funding, CETA. I think that's how you say the acronyms, or maybe you say CETA. I don't hear it out loud a lot. Um, but there have been it's a CETA, but you're absolutely right. That's a great example. CETA, CETA. yeah. Um, and there is, as far as I know, actually a small group of artists who got this federal CETA funding during the 1970s. Um, and this was a bipartisan, um, essentially a jobs training bill that um, I, I, the, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, so I don't want to say the numbers, but employed thousands of artists across the country and in the 70s. And what it did very differently was that it actually paid not the organizations themselves. So rather than employing the artists directly, it paid the organizations to hire the artists. And there's something in that model that is very powerful for what you were just mentioning, Karen, because it then filtered onto the stage. So there were a couple, for example, La Mama had um, quite a bit of CETA funding and did uh, one of its projects was an enormous Faust 
uh, that pulled from the neighborhood in order to cast this incredible Faust production and just um, employed a ton of people through it. So um, I'm excited about um, the sort of push since there are still, again, to your point, Karen, about these legacies and losing legacies, there are still a number of people who are saying, I, during the 1970s, I had no money except for Sita. And that is actually what we should more look back to. It's in our more recent history than perhaps a maybe slightly romanticized picture of what was possible um, uh, you know, during the um, WPA funding. So for me, that kind of a, that kind of a question um, leads to something that I wanted to ask you both about, which is um, if there are any, I guess I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, but maybe I'll explain it through what I've been experiencing, which is that, um, are there any sort of blind spots in your own research that, that you're now looking back, now it feels 2021, that you're saying, I want to do things a little differently. And, and for me, one of the examples is something like the CETA funding, where I was researching the 70s. I saw that this was happening. I was more interested in the local level. I didn't go quite deep into it. And now I'm realizing that I was so caught up in thinking about institutions, I often forgot about the survival of individual artists. And I have had so many reminders in the years since that work that I ignored a pretty fundamental piece, which was like working conditions of artists, how they're going to work. I was so caught up in looking at institutional dynamics. And that for me now, um, having gotten through this period and seeing how many artists have left the city and all of just the very particular needs to sustain an arts ecosystem, how often I lost sight of the individual in my own research. And that's something that I'm thinking a lot about these days. And I'm just wondering, um, if for both of you, you have any thoughts about how this time period has maybe changed, whether it's practices or methods or things you want to look at, or maybe it's changed aspects of the way you look at, at subjects that you have studied. I'm just curious about that. If the, the answer might be no. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. So Karen, cut cut me off if you have something particular because it does. I'm I'm struggling. I'm right to come there up. with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I was hoping you'd save me. Um, well, I'll say I'll bumble for a while, uh, for a bit, <laughs> and you can come up some. Um, one of the things about CETA though is that it was temporary. It was one year employment. So that that's that's a it was an interesting example. I think you're right to bring it up. It was incredibly important, and like uh, and one of the other things that's distinctive about that. Um, is federal level funding, you know, uh, again, like, you know, recognizing these very different sort of funding streams and, you know, that we kind of expect the city to, and the city does have a lot of money for the arts compared to any other city in the United States, you know, um, as well as the New York State Council on the Arts um, as well. So, you know, those are important funding streams, but to recognize that the federal government can do things that other levels of government can't do and employment like that is one of them or providing money for the CETA, though it should have been more than one year temporary. I think it's such a good point about not losing sight of individual artists. Um, you know, I struggle with that a lot in terms of wanting to have a kind of macro understanding of policy, of institutions, of context. And um, so one of the other things that I think about is figuring out, you know, representative artists or whatever, but also artworks, artworks, that it is that it's about artists. And, you know, in some of the ways that I was talking about, I think that, you know, artists as residents is sort of a, an important thing to understand is that they have impact on our lives. Artists impact our lives when we live next to them in our buildings um, when they live on our street and then have a musical concert outside in front of you, right? They don't just put on work in institutions, whether it be a cafe or a um, or Lincoln Center. So in that sense, artists as residents, I think is a really important distinction that is pretty powerful in New York City, that is a distinctive part of, the, of New York City. And the other thing that I try to think about and that I feel like I'm not yet at is that artworks themselves are important to understand in and of themselves as sort of not only representative of the moment, 
but that they have a life of their own as well, one that often goes on and on when they get reproduced in various things, when something that starts at the New York and that like, uh, you know, Miguel Pinero, that eventually gets to off-Broadway, that eventually gets to, um, it didn't start at the New York and I don't believe Short Eyes. Short Eyes went from the no, no, public. No, no. Yeah, from, went from the, the public oh, to, to Lincoln where? Center. To public Lincoln Center. to Lincoln Center, and then it was a movie with Robert. Oh, no, 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 wait. Lincoln Center, and then it went to Annenberg Center in Philly. Mm. Um, it's so it's so funny that you say that. I just finished an entry for this book on 50 queer theater artists, and I was writing on Pinheiro, and I'm like, wait, and I'm remembering that specific page. So yeah, it was the public, <laughs> then it was Lincoln Center, then was then it was Annenberg Center at UPenn, and then it became the movie that was directed by Robert Young. Such a good example, I think, that you know, not only what lives in our cultural lives and in our artistic lives is an artwork that you know travels many, goes through people, you know, has different kind, different people that are inhabiting that artwork. Um, that it's, I think, it's kind of useful to think sometimes to make sure that we're thinking in those terms as well, alongside artists, institutions, policy. It's a lot to do, <laughs> but I think it, just a reminder that 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 all of that is sort of makes up a cultural landscape. Thank you, Julia. That was wonderful. I don't have anything to add. It's so complete. <laughs> so complete. Well, so ready. that's great. No, I mean, it's actually um, absolutely appropriate with, you know, one of the things circulating was um, what are the, some of the works that are touchstones when I think of this moment? Um, of the 1970s, and of course, I wrote all about TKTS, and rarely um, stopped and looked at the shows on the stage. Sometimes I did, um, but you know, when you step back, um, there was um, there were two plays that were sort of anti-Vietnam War protests in, the, in 72 on Broadway. There was a Berrigan, Catonsville Nine play. There was a David Rabe play. So. I had been completely focused on all of these things and had lost a whole other context of the work on stage when I was writing about TKTS. And it's to your point, what were the actual shows that they were going to see? Not just the show that might've come up in a quote, but what were the actual <laughs> shows that were happening? So thank you for raising that. Um, I see that we are nearly at our time. Um, we are basically at our time. So um, mostly I just wanted to um, end off and thank everybody for coming. I wanted to make sure though, um, if there were just any last uh, thoughts that people wanted to get out about um, the topics, one of the things that I just wanted to sort of um, highlight uh, by bringing up the idea of the condition of artists is um, I was at an event where somebody mentioned that there was a big reopening um, event that was created by the state government uh, just about, let's say, I think it was a couple of months ago. And they had expected the artists to work for free because it was an exciting reopening New York event. And it actually took the head of the musicians union. I'm not saying what the event was, but it was a skirball event. So you could see it on YouTube if you want. Um, but it, it's not skirball center, but it was, um, uh, a story told by the head of the musicians union at the Skirball Center, that it basically took his intervention to say, um, if you're gonna have a reopening event when artists haven't been paid in over a year, you need to actually pay the artists, even though we're all excited that New York is opening. So for me, that's the reason why I keep remembering to sort of recenter the artists, because even when we are moving forward, we're not always, of course, thinking about um, that livelihood because we're thinking of so many other things. Um, so that's why I brought it up. Um, just a final note to give people um, a couple of words to end on before we close. Um, people have come up through the, um, through both of your discussions, um, you know, whether it's Ellen Stewart or Joseph Papp, I wonder if just as kind of a final note, um, is there a figure whose legacy we might sort of end, end the session with, end the session thinking about? And that could be a particular aspect of Algarine's work. It could be something about Holman, I'm not sure. But um, just in the spirit of thinking about this sort of individual push of the artists that we are investigating, is there anyone who comes to mind from our discussion today? I would be um, very curious to hear what we would sort of end off on for that. 
Well, I'll just mention, and it, it gets to the point of an artwork. I'm trying to think through um, a dance piece by Twyla Tharp called Deuce Coop. And um, it was performed first in 1973 It's and reimagined um, fairly shortly thereafter. But it was, you know, to the music of the Beach Boys, it was the first time that she, and it was on stage, uh, originally performed in Chicago, but then in City Center. And um, she has live graffiti artists behind her, uh, behind the dancers. And um, I really, that fascinates me, that juxtaposition that, you know, there's, there's a live a visual art going on behind the um, dancers. There's the, she did away with that after in about 1975, not having live graffiti artists anymore. Um, but that is a kind of juxtaposition that I think is really powerful to the moment. Um, as well as to sort of the thriving of the arts in the city together, to sort of recognize that you could have a, a big old modern dance piece by an avant-garde choreographer, as she was understood at the time, um, with graffiti writers um, creating some sort of event for predominantly white audiences. Um, what the heck is going on there? Um, so something like that sort of encapsulates the moment a bit for me. I think for me, um, it's, you mentioned Algarin and, and before his passing, um, I went to visit him. He was living in a facility, uh, nursing home on East 105th and just this conversation. And he's asked me, oh, what are you writing? What are you working on? And was like, you know what I was thinking? I think we should start, we need to start a writing workshop. Like let's do a poetry workshop with people here and like other folk. And for me, it's this enduring legacy that artists are always artists wherever they are, right? Like he's from a particular moment where it's about the art, where it's about the word, where it's about creating, right? He wasn't thinking like, how much money can I make, you know, through this writing workshop? It was like, oh, we need art in this moment. And it doesn't matter if you're living in a nursing home, but everybody has a story to tell, right? And artists have stories that they're trying to tell. How do they tell them and how are they able to tell them in a space, you know, in, this, in New York City where the cost of living is making it almost prohibitive for them to do that without thinking about the bottom line. This is not to say that I don't think that artists should get paid. I'm also an artist and it's always like, well, but, you know, why don't, why can't you do, everybody has, you're getting money from an event, you should always pay the artist right? Like this is work. There's labor involved in that. But this is, for me, that moment was, it doesn't matter how old he got, how sick he was. It was about creating art, right? And, and opening up opportunities for other people to also have their voices heard. Even if it was for like five people sitting inside of the cafeteria of a nursing home, it was let's, let's, let's utilize art to share, right? So that for me is, is, thinking about like a legacy of New York City and a performance starting in the 70s. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and thank you for that. The person that I was thinking about actually goes right along with that, which is Douglas Turner Ward, who very recently passed away, the head of the uh, Negro Ensemble Company um, in 1973, when he had a, um, a hit show that was being able to transfer to Broadway called The River Niger. Um, refused to participate in TKTS when it was in its earliest years, um, in part because he said, my audiences um, don't want the cheap seats. So don't try to put them off on my audiences. Um, they deserve the best seats. And I think it's such a great um, example of an artist who is saying, this innovative project just might not work for the art I'm trying to make and the audiences I'm making it for. Um, and similarly um, to the point that you just made, Karen, um, he also knew that it wouldn't help um, his company be more sustainable. It wasn't. It wouldn't financially allow them to make more work and and keep making the work that they really cared about. Um, and that was the person who I who just came to mind as you were telling that um, that beautiful story. So thank you for that. Um, and thanks to both of you for sharing 
um, your knowledge, your research with us today. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot and I just appreciate your time. Um, and thanks especially to everyone um, at the Siegel Center who made this possible, um, to Tanvi and to Jackie and to Andy and to Frank. Um, it's just great to be able to have this conversation um, in this setting and with all of you. Um, and we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you'll be back for the final Prelude events as well.